or donation so that Casa Plana could be restored. So, um, and she continues to work. Uh, her research interests include the study and preservation of art environments in the South. She's focused her work on environments that express spiritual and political significance. And these include, of course, St. Lawrence Casa Plana, Harkinster's Paradise Garden, and Joe Major's African Village in America. She was elected chair of the Pasquan Preservation Society in early 2016. And in that role, she supports the group on a range of projects, including grant writing, using programming, dose of training, archival maintenance, tourism research, and everything. And then there's the five. Um, Christy is the director of choral activities at Rising Star Middle School in Peachtree City, in Audience Volleyball, where she teaches over 250 students in six non audition choirs. So, if any of you who are teachers, you can make that news. May 2016, the Georgia Middle School Association's Teacher of the Year for Classroom Mission Central or the Middle Ballroom Community to make music accessible to all. She's a frequent presenter at state and national education conferences on the topic. She's previously worked in nonprofit business development for Phi and Fraternity, and most recently served on the Griffin Spalding Historical Society's Board of Directors, acting as its president in 2016. She's from Sonoya, Georgia, before there were zombies, and moved to historic Griffin 10 years ago, living there now with her husband, Trinidad. Um, thank you all both for being here. Um, Annie, I understand that, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, well, they're each going to tell you know, a little bit about their backgrounds and, and specific uh, narratives of what they have done within their communities, and then we want to sort of broaden that and talk about some larger That's 
that's in a nutshell what Padawan is. It, he, he sort of draws from different cultures from around the world and um, uh, uses them all together to this one pretty simple. And Sengong has a migration story as well. He does. Um, when he was, I believe, 14 years old, Sengong left Buena Vista um, and he went to New York for about 30 years. While in New York, he was an artist, um, he was a dancer, he was uh, a drug dealer, he was a bartender, um, he read tea leaves, he read cards, um, he did all kinds of things while in New York um, to, to take care of himself. Um, but after he started receiving visions, I think it's his second vision, um, was while he was in New York and he was the um, Pasquoian, giant Pasquoian came to him and said, go home and do something. So that's what he did. He realized that he could make as much money in Buena Vista telling fortunes as he could in New York. So he came down um, after his mother died in 1950. Um, and by 1956, he was staying in Buena Vista full time and started building Pasadena at that point. And continued to build it until his death in 1986. What does Pasadena look like? Uh, Pasadena. Um, looks like nothing you've ever seen before. Um, it's a definitely one of a kind, unique um, art environment. It's, uh, like I said, it, it uses all different kinds of cultures. Um, there are African cultures, Native American cultures, um, Asian cultures, uh, just from all over the world. Um, he was interested in all kinds of different cultures and religions. And um, most religions, most of the major um, religions of the world are represented in at Pathfind uh, somewhere. Tell us about your story as it relates to Pathfind. How did you first encounter this place? Um, my my first visit to Pathfind, um, I went with my dad, and um, it's the, space. the place was uh, it's it's basically in ruins. Um, there hadn't been any preservation, uh, major preservation uh, projects in, in years. Um, the paint was chipping, some of the walls were starting to crumble and tip over. Um, it just was in really bad shape. And um, I remember very distinctively, um, I reached out to one of the walls and just sort of gently placed my hand on the wall and it just, like, crumbled um, under under my hand. And I was just horrified. I thought, you know, I've, I've destroyed this great work of art, you know, what am I going to do? Like, I, I sort of joke that that kind of guilt from that moment has sort of driven all of my um, work for Passive One. Um, but uh, it, it, that was my first encounter, so it was, it was a little traumatic, but um, it, it, you know, it got me motivated. So then, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how graduate work focused on Passive One. So this that experience gave you something that drove you until how you came to sort of glow into your efforts. I, I was a fan of glows. Um, just, I, I live in Smyrna, Georgia, um, and I was a fan of glows, a fan of glory, and um, they, we were just having a, a regular board meeting and um, as Pond's director, Michael Paul, mentioned that um, the Georgia Council for the Arts um, and Glow Atlanta were interested in doing something with Pass Pond, and I was thrilled. Um, you know, this was so exciting to me that Glow Atlanta would come to Pass Pond and, and um, map Pass Pond the way that I had seen them do in Atlanta. Um, and uh, from there, uh, Laurie and a few um, others came and visited Pass Pond again. Um, they asked questions, we answered them to the best of our ability. Um, and uh, it, you know, she came and uh, talked to the Passamon Preservation Society, um, to the Marion County Chamber of Commerce, and um, it, it So, what were the needs of the community? Um, that's what I understand. Um, those conversations. She brings glow to a place. 
like that. I think um, what made our project different was that her closed performance was on a day that so many people were there. It was a festival. There was music playing. There were um, you know food vendors, all kinds of things going on at once. Um, so I think what we, we needed from her at, for the, the grand reopening was um, just some you know, alter, alternative entertainment for people um, and something something new, something that they've never seen before, something that they would remember. So how did people interact with the performers as they mapped House of Um It was it was a beautiful thing. Um, they just I, a small group would um, follow them throughout the whole thing. Um, spend maybe 15, 20 minutes, leave, come back, um, and uh, you know, I think, like I said, there were so many people there. There was other things going on, and um, it was really interesting the way um, the background noise just became that. It became sort of the background, and everything sort of slowed down in the flow, and you know, everything just was focused and intense, and you know the wind, the shadows, the, um, the shuffle of people walking, um, all of it sort of became part of this bigger experience that, um, that I think a lot of people you know, reacted positively to. There was also um, another point when um, the group sort of just huddled into um, sort of just a huddled group. And um, they were sort of humming at the same time, and um, people were just sort of drawn to that and just like adding themselves to this bigger um, huddle of people. It was, that was a, a highlight for sure. attention to the walls and to the artwork in a way that might have been missed um, otherwise. So I think that um, people spent time with St. Ode's art that day that um, they, they might not have done if Glow hadn't been there to sort of force them to engage with the, the walls. Can you share with people a little bit of an idea of where this place 
Griffin is in Spalding County, it's south, south metro Atlanta. Um, we have about 25,000 people that live there, and it's a very interesting place. It was actually, we like to say, the town that was supposed to be Atlanta. Um, when the tracks were laid, they were supposed to cross in Griffin. Um, so General Griffin bought up all the land and laid it on a grid pattern. And of course, the tracks did not cross in Griffin. They crossed in Terminus, now Atlanta. Um, so Griffin has a very proud past. Um, it's sort of laid out the way you would expect a major city to be laid out. Um, there, it was a very thriving um, mill town with a lot of money um, and a lot of people that lived there. It was a major pass through to get to Florida, so many people would stop in Griffin on the way to, to Florida. Um, so it has a very proud history. Because there was so much um, money from the mills there, it attracted some of the top architects in the southeast. Um, so the historic buildings are, are very amazing there, but since the closure of the mills, um, there's a surplus of housing, and it's not as many people anymore. So that's sort of the a little bit about Griffin. Um, so can you say a little bit about the wonderful uh, relationship that has been built and continues to develop between Globe and the yeah, so the way we were involved with GLOW is it started out, Griffin had two buildings that were on the Georgia Trust Places and Peril list. Our historic city hall was threatened with demolition and along with the Hastings building, which was our second oldest hospital. And at that point, the Georgia Trust and the Georgia Council for the Arts, Georgia Department of Economic Development, um, worked with Laurie and Glow to, it was the traveling show where they visited different towns across Georgia um, to highlight buildings in need. So Laurie um, and her moving artists came to Griffin and it, it really shook up our town in a good way and started doing, you know, um, moving art in front of buildings that people had not stopped and looked at for decades. And because of that, um, two of the buildings that they did move, actually three, our historic Rosenwald School, our city hall, and the Hastings building were all saved. Two were put on the SPOS ticket and, and was voted and passed from being restored. And another we had um, from video footage that was posted online, an investor from Australia found us and bought it and moved um, to Griffin to restore it. So, that one week has turned into two other one week installations that have happened. And it, it's amazing because when Lori first came to the town, she immediately mapped it and knew right where she wanted to center everything. I think even more so than those of us who had been there for a decade or longer. And that was, we were a typical town with a railroad track that runs in the middle. And for some in the town, there's a right and a wrong side of the track depending on what side of the track you're on, your, your viewpoint changes. And so Laurie immediately saw that in the first um, installation, I'll never forget, all the people who were stopping the cars and getting out of the street, she grabbed everyone's hands and went into the center of the bridge that goes over that railroad track. And a giant circle was created of hands that um, crossed the two sides of the track and none of the cops knew what to do. They all got out of their cars and they didn't know if they should arrest them or join the circle. It was a lot of confusion. <laughs> um, but from that moment um, in that vision, the next time the glow came, um, the same thing on that bridge and on that path, previously there had been a smaller bridge that had a sign that said, if you hit this sign, you will hit this bridge. And so it was this yellow sign that you had to go under. Um, and so it was this warning that if you hit the sign, you're gonna hit the bridge. Well, it was, that iconic sign was taken down when a new bridge was built and put in the Welcome Center. And Laurie found out about that and the moving artist stenciled all the way across the bridge, if you drew a blank, you will blank. And people were encouraged to go right in, if you, what will happen? And, 
And I think that's what has inspired Griffin and has made the partnership continue. If we, what will happen? And the next time Laurie came back, the city was thinking, um, thinking that way, and little Griffin, Georgia, had a, a dinner for 500 people in the middle of that bridge, crossing the tracks. And um, this is very outside of the box for Griffin, Georgia. And it's, it's little pebbles that Laurie and Glow has thrown that make others think, and then make others think, and make others think that's changing. Fairmont um, community is a community in Griffin that is a historically African-American community. It's a very proud um, community that was centered around, well, I guess it was there first and then the creation of the Rosenwald School is in the Fairmont community. Um, Rosenwald Schools were a partnership um, of the first historically African-American sort of public schools built by Julius Rosenwald, who was one of the founders of Sears and Roebuck, and also Booker T. Washington. Um, and in that partnership, it had to be a third match from the local 
local community, from the local businesses, and from their foundation. And so only about 10% of the Rosenwald schools are left in existence today. And Griffin has one, and we have one of the largest ones um, that was built, that four plan, it was brick, which shows how prosperous and proud the community was at the time it was built in the early 1900s, which is an amazing thing, and that pride is definitely still there in the Fairmont community. So, when I arrived, I had thought that the focus was going to be on the Fairmont School, but um, at that point, Glow had brought a documentary film on Julius Rosenwald to the community and lots of community leaders had crowded into a small room in the, um, the tourism bureau there at the depot and recognized the value of this place. And so the Rosenwald School had at this point attracted a lot of support from the community to restore the building. So then attention turned, and I'm not sure how that happened, but attention turned to the street Baptist Church. Yeah, so the, um, the Rosenwald School had been um, placed on the SWAST ballot that was passed, and so funds were being earmarked to, to save that structure. Um, and I think what was one thing that was so important with the Rosenwald Field coming to Griffin is the Fairmont community knew how important that school was to them, and Griffin understood how important that school was. But there wasn't necessarily a big awareness of the history, past the, the local history to people, like what was the history and the relevance of it to the nation? And why, why do people care outside of Griffin about the school? So I think that film really opened that up. Um, because of that, when the SWAS ballot was passed, um, the preservation timeline for the structure, and we were grateful for it, halted and slowed down because they were like, whoa, this is a big deal. We can't throw $50,000 at this and walk away. Like, we really have to think about how can we do this correctly. And so the original timeline um, slowed down because originally Laurie was going to come activate the space once the school was restored. Um, but we're very fortunate that now because of the awareness, it's going to be restored in, in a way that's appropriate to the meaning of the place. And because of that, um, the conversation turned to, well, what's another place we can activate that's part of the community? And so the historic Eighth Street Baptist Church was um, a very a church instrumental in the civil rights movement in Griffin, and it had sat vacant for over 30 years in, in downtown Griffin. And so when the space at the Rosenwald School in Fairmont was not available to activate, um, Laurie moved the vision to Rosenwald School temporarily. To the, to the oh, sorry, the A Street Baptist Church, yes. So um, I'm going to edit as I go. But basically, um, the, from what I understood, from what Laurie told me, the congregation had planned on using, continuing to use the space. They moved to, the congregation had outgrown this building, which is a beautiful building. It was built originally in 1862. Some additions had been made, but mostly just cosmetic. The primary structure was still there. Beautiful sanctuary. I think the proportion of the space is not unlike this room um, in terms of size. Um, beautiful space, um, but needed a lot of attention. So um, it had been kind of been locked away for a while. The congregation had their new space, which was over by the Fairmont. It was on the other side of the tracks. Um, historically, Kenda were here. She could tell us. Kenda used. To, Kenda grew up. She grew up in Fairmont. She used to sit on the wall outside of this church. There's an alley that goes back into what was. Uh, business center of the black community there, that, and she would sit, and uh, especially for Easter, she would get her hair done, and, and you didn't make an appointment, you just sat on the wall and waited your turn. Uh, but this is where there, you know, there were all kinds of businesses, and this church was right there, kind of at the cornerstone of this 
um, quite a prosperous business center in the community, right? Just right on the edge of the street area. And then if you went down the street, just on the other side of the church, you would get to the and the Sixth Street Bridge, which would take you over the track. historically black Fairmont neighborhood. Um, actually, it was, it was once probably the best place to live, uh, if you were a member of that community. Um, but it was really kind of a poverty-stricken place uh, by the time I got there. A lot of people had abandoned their homes. The problem worsened after the recession. Um, actually, yeah, it was in the early 90s when a lot of them were I, I think in the 20s, around that Yeah, many. around 20 years. And you can drive by these huge red brick complexes. And a lot of them are just vacant yeah. there. Yeah. And many of the mills have been torn down. Um, Hunger Games, the second one that was filmed, they tore down a mill um, in filming that. So many of our, but there are still several large ones left. Beautiful 
the beauty of um, these towns in Georgia is that um, it's very clear that the towns are still honoring um, the, the natives, the folks that have spent generations on the streets, generations in, in, in a church, in a school, um, a teacher who spent 70 years with students, and, and so what I'm talking about are the uh, kings and queens that are still in the neighborhood. And um, perhaps St. Elm um, made his own kingship in Pasaquan, and then towns like Griffin, um, perhaps they don't have a, a, a big wacky artist, psychedelic man who comes in and has a bunch of cats in his Cadillac and, and jars around and um, creates his own religion and own space. But what they do have, what Griffin does have, is, um, is these beautiful narrators. Um, one in particular, um, Miss Jewel. Um, I, was, um, I remember being told um, like the moment my feet stepped like onto the ground of Griffin, well, um, just know that you can't do anything without Miss Jewel's blessing. And suddenly Miss Jewel in my mind was um, this really big myth mystical thing. And um, I will say it was a highlight when I finally got to meet her. Um, and uh, she's tough and um, she, has the, um, she has the will and the desires of the memories of the space, the memories of the Fairmont community inside of her as a child and her mother and her mother. And um, I'm really turned on by all those, those bits, those genes that pass down from one person to the other. And, um, and that's how I find space and it finds me. So um, Miss Jewel is an example of spending time with the, um, the narrators in a town and there are many in, in Griffin, and we certainly won't leave here without, um, um, without um, having um, Rick Carlin, who's the GM of GLOW, um, Brother Jimmy, who, who's in um, Cynthia's writings, um, is uh, integral to the project in Griffin. So Brother Jimmy and his congregation are the stakeholders and the dream holders of the 8th Street Historic Church. And um, Brother Jimmy and Brother Rick um, spend a quite a bit of time together. And then they let crazy artist Larry come in. <laughs> and um, and um, so uh, um, as far as how we found the 8th Street Church, um, the first day I met Christy, I also met about two dozen a dozen and a half other Griffin leaders um, and, and um, agencies. And the first place that this big group of people, including Kenda, sorry, she's always delayed, um, uh, but has well inten good intentions. So a big congregation meets me in the parking lot of the, of the hospital. And, um, and the first place they take me is the 8th Street Church. And that was my introduction to Griffin, the town. And um, they had to pry me out of there because I hadn't even gotten to the Rosenwald School yet, but I was in love. And they did give me a, give me a few minutes in the church by myself. And so um, our first residency, we actually um, occupied the space very temporarily. We had big dreams um, and included um, a, a longtime collaborator, big group, narrator of Outcast, really wicked artist. And uh, he and I have been working together since um, the work that kept me here. So we've been on big stages together, and we've also been in these um, hidden places. Big Group has been with us in Griffin. Big Group has been with us in Warm Springs for the traveling show at the Warm Springs Institute, working with very special high school students and um, trying to organize their thoughts in their mouth. <laughs> so they, um, they speak what they mean. And all of this, of course, is through um, poetry and hip hop, the power of hip hop, especially in the South, in the American South culture. So um, needless to say, that church found me, and um, it took me a while to get back to it. But how that happened was um, when it was clear that the Rosenwald School had some love and had some uh, longevity around it, then, um, and also a, a, a plan. Then um, the, uh, the incredible Kenwin Hayes, 
who was the downtown development director for Griffin up until about six weeks ago. He, um, he said, what about that church you love? It needs some loving. And um, that was pretty much it. So um, it just turns out that um, these towns in Georgia um, are thinking about preservation and they are pausing before they get a demolition truck or just tear something down before having a really big conversation about it. And I'll be frank, we could never have these projects happen here in Atlanta because it happens too fast and people are on a different kind of method track than most artists. So the artists are willing to slow down and, and, um, and identify constructs around conversations about preservation in place and storytelling, but not that, that means that the town has to be amidst that, that meditation and that group. And uh, places like Atlanta is, um, um, is uh, places like Atlanta are, excuse me, are um, oftentimes um, being sidetracked, those conversations, because of needs of developers and needs of um, economy and needs of power. And so um, the, the efforts in Griffin are a gift, and we are able to learn and experiment on a very, in a very deep fashion um, in ways that here in Atlanta almost might be impossible right now. So um, did I answer your question? OK. And that brings me to another question, um, a couple questions. One, um, and this may be, you know, Yeah, I think for me, um, that conversation in a small town and where things are in a certain box and they've always been that way and you've grown up in there, it takes people on the outside. It takes um, artists coming in. It takes new people moving in. Um, I'm not from Griffin. I moved there 10 years ago. So when I came to Griffin, I didn't see, like I saw the tracks, but I didn't see what somebody might see if they grew up here. Um, and so for me, like, my Griffin story started with a dumpster. Um, I, we had just remodeled a house, and when we moved to Griffin, and there was an empty lot right across, there was this beautiful park area, and then all of a sudden there's a zoning ordinance that goes up, and they're about to put a, um, a, an office building in a residential neighborhood. And so I went to the zoning meeting, and my husband and I just knew the whole street was going to show up, and we were it. We were the only people there. Um, and so they had the plans out, and they were literally going to put a dumpster in front of my house that I had just bought and poured tens of thousands of dollars into. And um, so I remember going up to that podium and being like, you can't put a dumpster in front of my house. And they were like, okay. And they moved the dumpster. And that's when I realized the power of small towns and the power of Griffin and the power of caring is if you care enough to show up and say what you want to have happen, um, in small towns it can happen. And that's the difference, I think, between a large town and a small town. And so for my husband and I, that was sort of like our wake up call. And when we saw buildings that were threatened with demolition, we're like, well, why? Why does that have to be? And so, um, 
we created a YouTube video that sort of went viral and then got a GoFundMe and got one building stopped. And, and so that's, it's not necessarily like, will the funds run out? It's will the vision run out? And so I think that's the thing is when, in a small town, when there's so many naysayers because they've been this way for so long, and it takes somebody like Glow coming in and making people look at something a little bit differently and then realizing we can do that too. Um, and so I think that that's, that's the beauty of small towns and the beauty of preservation, that it's empowering the communities to believe in themselves again. And once that happens, anything's possible. Um, and with the Fairmont community, um, you know, I represent the historical society, but the Fairmont community in Rosenwald School was on a track to preservation long before we ever stepped in. And that was the Fairmont community itself. Um, and Ms. Jewell and the local NAACP chapter was so passionate about it. And the local housing authority said, what can we do to stop this blight? And they, it was something as simple as a community garden. And that started other dreaming and other spaces. And so it doesn't have to be this, here's a million dollar check. It's like, what can you do one step at a time? But it, it just, so that's why I think people from the outside who can see things differently sometimes help spur those that have been there. Right, the community doesn't come up with the multi 
don't know how many million dollars For me personally, um, when I, I left, I, I grew up near Buena Vista um, in nearby Lumpkin, Georgia. It's a very similar kind of community. Um, both cities are majority black um, and just a smaller um, white community. Uh, Marion County is majority white, but Buena Vista is um, majority black. Um, but so I, I grew up in a similar community as. Um, so I um, was eager, just like St. Home, I was eager to get out of um, such a rural area. I thought, you know, I'm going to escape all the homophobia and the racism and like all these negative things that I was associating with my small town. And um, I'll go to college and, you know, I'll meet people who are open-minded. And uh, while to a degree that did happen, I realized very quickly that homophobia and racism was everywhere. And um, so I... That I was able, I, I met people, I had new experiences, and just, you know, St. Owen's world was expanded by uh, his time in New York City, for sure. Um, and he felt compelled to come back, and really, I, I think for him, he sort of felt that he had not been accepted by the arts community in New York City. 
he um, said that he had never really been able to get in with that click. Um, so I think he was sort of bitter that he had never really been embraced by the New York arts community. Um, and he was just um, ready to just go be himself as much as possible. And so he came, you know, this um, flamboyant gay man wearing, you know, all his regalia and like um, feathers in his hair. He was always wearing like bells. People say that they could hear him come in through town. Um, he was uh, very eccentric. Um, he sort of became Unibus's. Um, pride, you know, Fred Fussell always likes to say every small town has their eccentric, and Buena Vista just happened to have one of the best ones that there was. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I'm, did, what was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just talking about, um, the, you know, uh, about my membership. Okay, um, so I think I, I, he was compelled to come home and um, bring all of what he had learned from different cultures um, back to Buena Vista. He wasn't afraid of it. It was a very, you know, uh, brave thing that he did to go to rural Georgia and be as out as he was. Um, but as I was saying, you know, I think the community um, just sort of accepted him as theirs and uh, didn't bother him for the most part, um, although he, he liked to sort of um, create myths about himself, so he told people, you know, that he could speak to, to snakes, and um, as, as Laurie was saying, that there are stories about um, cats just being packed full into his um, station wagon, he would open the door and all these cats would go run in, and then when he was done, whatever he was doing, buying paint at the, the local hardware store or whatever it was, all the cats would come running back and get back into the, the car. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly glad that he he felt the need to create his own space um, to leave uh, New York and to bring to Buena Vista what he did. And um, you know, I think um, for my part, um, I'm I feel compelled to go um, into these uh, rural communities like my hometown. And to I think a lot of times maybe don't understand exactly how important something in their backyard is and you know it's I think it's important for me to to be a part of those uh, movements and to preserve um, small towns um, and the great art and artists that come out of them. Um, so I'm going to open it for questions but um, just a little bit for you Christy about bringing an outside artist um, the kinds of resistance that is sometimes sometimes needs and bringing an outside artist um, and at the same time it seems like small communities in general and the community needs outside influences whether it's somebody from that community who migrates somewhere else and brings something back to it or an outside artist Um, can you speak a little bit to maybe the challenges with these exchanges and also some of the, the changes? Yeah, I think um, you're going to find that resistance in most small towns because it's um, full of people who've chosen their whole life to stay there because they love what that town offers and they don't necessarily want that to change. So I think that that is always, always going to be a challenge. Um, and Griffin is sort of infamous for our resistance because of the mills being there for so long, um, a lot of the leadership in the town didn't want things to change. So like um, Interstate 75 um, was voted down coming through Griffin um, because uh, you, know, you don't want that access necessarily for your workers to go somewhere else and find better paying jobs somewhere else. And so that, that stayed in Griffin, so 75, it's on the outskirts because that was voted down. And so there's been time and time again, things like that, that resistance has been there. And I think now a lot of that resistance, I would say four or five years ago, was um, sort of a way of preservation, of trying to keep things the way they were and, and hope that they come back to the way they were because it used to be such an affluent town for so long. And 
I think that there's also that fear of outsiders and that why are they here? Are they here to make money off of us? What is the reasoning for them coming? Why do they see value here? I don't see value here. You know, I think that that's the conversation that happens too. Um, but for Griffin, I definitely think at the beginning, um, when the Georgia Department of Economic Development, Council for the Arts, Georgia Trust, GLOW is starting to show interest, the leadership sort of just sat back and they're like, what is happening? Um, but the more they looked into it, and I think the more excited they became, and I definitely think the turning point was when the mayor came um, with us and we went to the goat farm and saw Glow do um, Cloth Field with Robert Spano. And it was awesome because he told his wife that they were going to a piano performance. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> afterwards when we left, she looked at me and she was like, what kind of piano performance is that? <laughs> um, but it was so, <laughs> it was so, um, you know, eye-opening and experience-opening for the leadership of this small town. And um, Dick Morrow, who was the mayor at the time, wonderful, not from Griffin, an outsider who came in, who's done so much for our town. When we got in the car, he said, I might not understand everything there is about movement art, but I understand vision, and I understand when I see something successful. And if you have Robert Spano playing and you're spending two grand pianos around in a room, that's successful, then you become a Griffin. <laughs> so, I, you know, so it was a live conversation, the 45 minutes south that night. But I think when you get people out of those comfort zones and you bring them up here and see what's happening and then they realize that they, it's, I think people are so afraid of being seen as, um, well, just being wrong and and not wanting to get everybody's hopes up and hope that, that and then get dashed and that's that's it's like this self-preservation technique. But having a new artist come in sort of give you the license to dream again, to imagine again, to think about what something could be, and um, I think that that's been an amazing thing with Glow. So I I definitely am not going to say that it's it's been smooth because you there's you're always going to meet that resistance. And until they see the potential, and a lot of that is, is getting them out of their comfort zone to see that potential as well. No, he knew because he, um, the mayor had, had been to some of Glow's work before. He, he knew, but his, his wife did not know. And so, in order to get his wife there, he just set a piano performance. So. <laughs> how, is, how is Buena Vista now reacting and inter interacting, I guess I would say, with Passive One? Have you seen an uptick? Do you see more, more activity? Um, I, I think that, well, we've got, um, we just added another Pina Vista native um, to our, our board, um, and um, the uh, chair of the Chamber of Commerce is on our board as well, um, and, you know, I think we have a lot to do in terms of developing uh, more relationships with um, Marion County, but I think right now the, the important thing is that they're seeing the economic value and um, we're just sort of using that as a beginning way to just have talks about how, like I, I would love to have um, some uh, Marion County students come in and uh, we're, we're developing a dose of training program right now. I would love to get some Marion County students in that dose of training program. Um, so hopefully that'll be a way that we can start soon.
right now. Yeah. I think one of the things too that has been great about the buildings being saved, like the Rosenwald School, the Historic City Wall, Hall, Hastings Building, is, um, and I know Cynthia talked about this a little bit earlier, there's a funding that the city has received to demolish um, properties that are substandard. So before demolition was sort of just anything that was vacant was being demolished. And through all of this conversations have started happening, of we understand the need to get rid of blight, but we also need to make sure that we're preserving and protecting our neighborhoods, not only the East College and Maple Street neighborhoods, but the Mill Villages and Fairmont Village is so important. And once you take down a house, you can't get back. And so those um, strategic conversations are happening now in Griffin, which is so exciting that and a lot of this is through the Archway Partnership, um, through UGA has, has really helped get the school system and the government involved. And we have a great person over the Housing Authority now, and Ken is now with the Housing Authority as well. So these conversations of all the community leaders are happening and saying, how can we be strategic about revitalizing these neighborhoods, um, at looking at potential historic districts, um, because I think what they're realizing is that, you know, five or six years ago the conversation was, let's tear down as much as we can and build. But now they're realizing that what we have, these historic buildings, is what makes Griffin unique. And it's also what's driving a lot of our industry right now, which is movies, because we're so close to Pinewood Studios. And it, it's not a week that goes by that there aren't film trucks downtown. And they can do so much filming in Griffin because of, you know, the the buildings that are there. So before what seemed problematic, I think now the conversation has turned to it being an asset and how do we protect those assets strategically um, at the same time, you know, making sure that we're getting rid of blight um, in, in a responsible way, but also ensuring that the stories of the people who have been there for, you know, centuries are safe. So. Preserve those stories. Well, with the historical society, we have historical luncheons um, that, from time to time, we have people come in and sort of record um, their history. So we had like a rocking chair luncheon where everyone sits in rocking chairs and we record um, those things. I know that there's also we have the archives. We have we're lucky in Griffin that we have a, an archivist now who is recording a lot of those stories as well. Um, so that's, that's something that is important, but then you also worry about whose stories are being recorded and whose stories aren't being recorded. So really empowering all the different agencies in Griffin to reach out, uh, because we're definitely getting to a time where um, you know, people are passing away, and especially those who were instrumental in the civil rights era, instrumental in, um, Rose, can remember the Rosenwald School when, um, we need all those stories recorded, so that's something that um, it is happening, but I think could definitely progress more um, with more organizations involved. Over everything. And then I drove by the Rosenwald 
the school. And across the street, there was a small white green house with words on a couple of little words sitting in front. Future site of the Griffin Historical Consumption. Yes. So tell me the story about that. So that, that is by um, a group of individuals in the area, and I had a t an opportunity, Freddie Phillips, I believe is the name of the, the man who is doing that, and he's wonderful. And he grew up in the Fairmont community, also um, went to school there, and was this is a lifelong collector of information about the Fairmont community and the school. And so he is very excited. Um, this is really him, and, and he's a pastor, and he has people behind him doing it, and we worked with them to co-write a grant about a, a year or so ago. And they're just wanting a facility right across the street where they can house information about Rosenwald School and Fairmont. So that is um, coming from the Fairmont community, which we're, we're very excited about seeing that happen and that support. And I know that they're also working to preserve stories as well. Um, but the interesting thing in Griffin, I think, is in, in the, I think we brought this up earlier, is the need for everyone to work together 